All right, good morning, everybody. Um, technical difficulties. I was playing around with the effects in this live broadcast, and then the effects got stuck. So when I was trying to exit the effects, it would not give me the options at the bottom to switch off the effects or switch to a different effect. So I guess I'm not going to play with that. Maybe towards the end of this video, just for a little bit of fun. Just for a little bit of fun, but um, not right now. <laughs> As you know, I do have a topic to discuss today. Today, on the live show, we are talking about the current state of mobile technology. We are going to be talking about what's going on and the differences between yesteryears and today, um, especially when there's new phones coming out. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about vaping in here too, but... Let's talk about mobile technology. So, um, the current state of mobile technology, and before going any more forward, because I should put this kind of like as a disclaimer, uh, this part is totally subjective. You guys may not agree with me on this, and that's fine. That's totally fine. I'm, I'm you know, no one's gonna have a cow about it. Um, but this is just where um, like my thought process is, okay? So you guys may think differently, and that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of life. That's the beauty of the world, is that we're all not one-way thinking, one-way living. Well, we can make up our own minds and think the way we want to think, you know? So that's the beauty of it. Um, so I just kind of wanted to put that out there as a disclaimer. But anyhow, current state of mobile technology to me. Where do I see mobile technology going? And today... Well, I think the camera's a bit too high, so let's just kind of adjust that. All right, so um, today I feel like mobile technology has gone completely left field and has gone directly towards gimmicky features. Gimmicky features seems to be the thing that is capturing the minds and the hearts of consumers out there who are interested in mobile technology, because let's face it, Everyone has an interest for mobile technology. You don't have to be geek savvy. You don't have to be a nerd to have an interest in mobile technology because everyone uses their smartphones. Smartphones is an extension of the human body, a little micro pocket computer that does about everything for you. I mean, you can make phone calls on it. You can send a short message to a friend. You can get into a more immersive chat um, conversation going on. You can video call people, see people halfway around the world. You can share photos and videos on your social media platforms. You know, heck, you can play games online with your smartphone today. And um, it's, just, it's just an extension of us. So we use it for everything. We use it for banking to pay for stuff. The whole nine yards. But when you kind of think today, like today where mobile technology is, today what OEMs are doing it is very different than what they used to do for us back in the day. Now, I'm going back as far as, you know, 2010, 11, 12, 13. When we started seeing some gimmicky things make its way into mobile technology, but some of them were useful and some of them were cool. But I think back then, uh, OEMs were more focused on getting a smooth experience with their software on their hardware. So with that, what I mean is, is that back in the day, I mean, you know, iPhone was king. So let's not, let's not kid ourselves. Um, back then, iOS was really polished and was doing really, really well. And the people that some called the ice sheep um, would literally have like heavier ammunition and online social media battle wars over mobile OSs. So back then you had companies like LG, Samsung, and all of them really trying to find a way to make the software experience on their hardware um, smooth. And back then it was really hard to do because, um, you know, skins like uh, Sense by HTC, uh, TouchWiz by Samsung, especially TouchWiz by Samsung. TouchWiz by Samsung was by far probably the clunkiest one to use. Moto Blur by Motorola. Um, LG really didn't have so much of a, of, of a UI back then, um, or a skin, 
so much that that was recognized like it is right now. Like with LG right now, they have what's called UX, uh, which is user experience. That's all it stands for, you know. It's uh, so LG user experience, you know, 5.0. I think was the latest one that I've ever actually got to use. Um, I don't know exactly where it's at, and it's incremental updates. But um, you guys get where I'm going with this. So uh, with those skins on top of Android, because Android is open source. Android, you yourself can you know develop your own hardware. Um, get Android, put it on your phone, and if you don't want to use the stock Android, you can develop your own um, skin or UI to go on top of Android and give it a completely different look. And you can do anything from like what um, you know my UI did with um, uh, with you know their ROM itself um, that. A lot of people back in the day was like, it was blasphemy to have this, you know, Android skin that resembled parts of iOS on there. Um, just so many people went bananas over it, and it, it was just crazy um, how much people got upset about that. But, you know, you yourself could do this. And uh, so back then, OEMs were really trying to make, you know, the Android experience on their hardware as smooth as possible. And, and we saw things from like, you know, the creation of the Hummingbird processor to um, Project Butter, different things that you know Google and these OEMs were, were working on uh, to bring a smooth software experience because no matter what hardware you have, if the UX is not a good experience, then uh, you're gonna end up hating the phone. It don't matter what kind of hardware features it has, you're just gonna end up hating the phone because why would you like something that you're not having the greatest experience with? And hardware is, you know, partially used with your smartphone, but majority of it is the software you're using on it. So th back then, I felt like that was what the main goal was for OEMs. And, and then once they started to to have a better way of polishing the, the, the software experience on their hardware, because Google also was getting better with Android, it just seems like that they kind of started going towards gimmicky things. The HTC Evo 3D, probably, you know, a phone that, you know, I will always remember just for the fact that it was one of the first phones that was able to start doing um, 3D photography and, well, I don't think for photography, but I do know a 3D video. I, I can't remember if I did 3D photography with that, but I know a screen was adopted for you to be able to see 3D imagery and video without the need of 3D glasses. So that was one really, really cool thing. But can anyone say that that was innovative for a purpose? And the answer is no. It's not innovative for a purpose. It was innovative for a, for a gimmicky idea. The idea to take 3D video and then when you're gonna show those videos to your friends so that they can experience the 3D quality Without the need of 3D glasses, the screen was developed to be able to bring you that 3D look that you're shooting. Because they had two cameras. They had two cameras on the back. Let's not forget. Let's not kid ourselves. Today, everyone um, gets overly excited for dual cameras on a smartphone because of an in-depth feel and the blurred background known as bokeh. Um, everyone just goes bananas over taking photos like that because... It pops the subject into life and um, kind of brings it to the forefront, which, you know, is not bad for photography, but dual cameras have been around a lot longer than since the past couple of years, okay? The Evo 3D was one with dual cameras. So, but back then, that's what, what the goal was. The, the goal was, the goal was to make your entire experience with your smartphone as best as possible by trying to have an Android device running stock Android with a OEM's skin on top of it and deliver a good experience. Because back then, that is the absolute reason and the absolute for argument's sake, the reason why most techies were gunning for the Nexus phones. This is why. If you know what Nexus is, but you are like, well, I'm not too sure about it, and uh, I mean, I'm, I've heard of it, but why were everyone chasing it back in the day? That is the reason why. Nexus was developed to be a de like a developer's tool. So anyone that was developing apps and games and stuff for Android, 
the Nexus phone was that idea for them to, uh, it was their base. It was their base to use to create for Android and test it and to make sure it worked. It was the form of developers to have something to beta test on. And it just got popular because, you know, it, it, was, in the, it was in the market for average consumers to get. And when average consumers bought a Nexus phone had a greater experience because it ran stock Android. And whatever version of Android came out, that device was able to update to at least um, three, you know, three major software updates before it started to become irrelevant. So that means, you know, even though a new Nexus phone came out that year, if you had one that was two years old, you can bet your bottom dollar that your two year old Nexus was going to get the same update that the new Nexus has. Um, that's what Nexus was, and that's why people went towards it because they didn't have touch with Sense, Moto Blur, or anything over it. They had pure stock Android for a pure stock Android experience, and that's what they wanted. And 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 even though then Android still wasn't wasn't as polished as it is now, it made for a great experience. So that was the goal of back then. That was the goal of yesteryears, making the best experience possible. Does that happen today? No. In my opinion, it does not happen at all today. That is not what the OEMs are showing they're focused on. What they're showing is who can outdo the next person. What could I do with my flagship hardware that's going to make people stop thinking of that company's hardware and I'm going to do something like 3D facial unlocking. 3D facial unlocking. You will not, you guys don't know how many people talk to me about this a day and go off about it until I actually put it in perspective for them to understand. Okay? 3D facial unlocking is absolutely cool. It's insanely cool. You cannot knock it. You cannot, you know, just say, ah, oh, it's, a, it's an iOS thing. It's, it sucks because it's iOS. It's Apple. Like, no, you can't. If you're saying that, you're lying to yourself and you're lying to those around you. It's really cool. The ability to unlock your phone and not be able to trick it with a photograph because it has to have targeted points on your face that these little lasers from the front facing camera of the iPhone 10 lock onto your face to construct a 3D imagery. And it does it pretty quickly because considering the technology that, they, that, that they're explaining how this, how this works, it works pretty good some of the times. But it is not a necessity to have. This is a gimmick. It's always been a gimmick. Before Apple and the iPhone 10 did it, when it was on the Galaxy Note 7, when it was even facial recognition, when it was on the Evo 3D, it was gimmicky. It's a gimmick. It's a gimmick. I'm sorry. You can tell me anything in the world to say that this is why we absolutely need to have this. It's a gimmick. Thumb, thumb to unlock, you know, biometric reading. It's a gimmick. We've had security to protect our phones for the longest time on Android. Pin, pattern, and uh, password. The three Ps. We've had them. It's just people are getting lazier to do things. It's harder for people today to type in, you know, a four to ten digit code. It's harder for people to draw a pattern on the screen with their finger. It's harder for people to type in a password, which defeats the purpose, and I'll tell you why. People today are willing to chat up the yin-yang on any, on any social media platform or any social networking platform. They are willing to chat, they're willing. People today rarely make phone calls, they will text somebody. Even if it's a long, like say a, a conversation that would have only lasted a minute because you had maybe about five you know five thousand words to say in your short span people would rather spend ten minutes texting all that out texting has pretty much nearly killed phone calls and um, it just baffles me how people are willing to spend ten minutes on a conversation that would have ended in one or two minutes if you were just to vocally express it just to text out something but can't deal with, you know, um, 45 seconds of typing in a four-digit code or swiping a pattern 
or typing a password. That's crazy. But then biometric reading came in, with, you know, came in which was, um, yes, it is secure because you know, no two humans share the same exact finger, fingerprint. So that came in, and yeah, it, you know, in, in, in theory and in sense, it, it does offer a level of security. And on top of it offering a level of security, um, just people seeing that you need a, a fingerprint to unlock a phone gives, you know, kind of also add, acts as a, um, a deflector, you know, like someone who may be possibly thinking like, okay, you know what, when that person's not thinking, I'm going to snatch their phone out of their hand and run. Uh, may think twice because of like, even if I snatch the phone, am I going to risk getting caught, risk going to jail for something that I might not be able to open? So yeah, okay, it, it kind of does, you know, give that um, give that off. Um, but normally it doesn't because people think if you reset the phone, that's it. Even though resetting the phone also triggers security because you need to sign into the last known account on the phone before the phone will boot up completely all the way. So. Um, yeah, fingerprint, um, 3D facial recognition to unlock. Those are gimmicky, okay? All screen display, gimmicky. There is absolutely not one in, like, instantly good reason for a phone to have an all screen display with no bezels. That's just, yeah, it's just gonna make things more complicated for anyone out there who, well, you know, probably wants to play a game or something. You're gonna have your fingers on the screen or or, or the chubs off, you know, the base of you know your hand. Um, probably doing some crazy stuff and yeah, it's just it's all gimmicky. The removal of the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, gimmicky. Gimmicky and stupid, but I mean the the things that they're doing today is just it just feels like that that OEMs don't care anymore. You see a lot of things happening: um, screen display issues, uh, screen retention, burn in. You see those things, and it's like you didn't you didn't really hear too much about that back in the day because it just seemed like that OEM spent more time on you know developing a good software experience and doubling up on checking their hardware to make sure that they didn't have any issues because nobody wanted to fall behind because of a recall or some sort of issue when it happened you know OEMs usually came out really quick with a fix and we're not seeing that anymore we're not you know we're not at all you can have a problem with the phone and that problem is probably going to stay with the phone for the next three four five six months before it's either addressed or fixed by the OEM. Plain and simple. So, with that, I say, um, the current state of mobile technology to me is a bit depressing. I said it, it's a bit depressing. It's nice to see what um, what OEMs are coming up with, you know, like Samsung and its Infinity Display, LG and its, uh, you know, edge to edge near bezel-less display, the iPhone 10 and it's uh, all, all screen dis display except for the top notch. Um, essential phone with just its little camera notch on the top or it's, you know its camera pod that takes up a percentage of the display this is just, you know it, it's cool to see that don't get me wrong it's cool but that's where I'm saying it's a gimmick though because it's not an absolute necessity to have phones you know built that way um, you know one of the things that that, that that made me want to talk about this you know today on the pod, well, live broadcast podcast what you want to call it is like okay like Razer put out a phone Right, Razer put out the phone that uh, after acquiring um, was it a uh, Nextbit? They put out a phone, and yes, it looks identically to the Robin, other than it has dual cameras on the back, and it is bigger than the Nextbit Robin, and um, it just has some specs that you know will give you or deliver you a great software experience, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But um, you know, one of the things that, 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 that triggered me was the fact that, you know, people were jumping on it like it's an ugly phone, but not because that it's rectangular 
Um, it's you know it's, it's it's corners are not rounded. It's not you know it just looks like a like a rectangular block. Um, what got me triggered basically was the fact that people were like, it's it's gonna suck. It's not gonna work out because it it has bevels on the top and bottom. Okay, like I have my next bit wrong in here. I, I really love this film. Um, no matter what anyone says, I really love this film. Okay, but this is basically what the Razor phone looks like. Just technically, you know, this is what it looks like. Except that it has dual cameras on the back, um, and it has really good, um, really good, insane uh, front stereo speakers. And the, the specs on the Razer phone is actually pretty cool. Um, so it can, so you know, it's built basically for gaming on, you know, on the phone. And uh, with the specs that they threw in there, just imagine what the user experience is going to be um, with, you know, having I think it's like what, like eight gigabytes of RAM. Um, the the screen imagery it can. Uh, display video in um, 120 frames per second, which is double than what people are trying to achieve with only 60 frames per second. You can do 120 frames per second on that phone. It, it's like the fact that it has these these two bezels right here, okay? Got people like, I'm not going to get that phone and all this other stuff. Like, like, heaven forbid you will have a great experience with a phone that is you know, in a way, kind of overly powered. I mean, they did the same thing, like OnePlus did the same thing with their phone when they were offering six gigabytes of RAM, and um, now Razer is doing it with their phone, but they have a legitimate reason because they are completely around gaming. I mean, before they even got into the phone game, they were all about building, you know, game pads, um, you know, game, game mouses, basically for, you know, gaming laptops, gaming computers. They, they were, they, that's where their, their main bread and butter is, is they're, they're totally about the gaming experience. And with, um, with the Razer phone being built that way, I mean, that's the reason why. So to the average consumer, yeah, it's gimmicky. Um, is there a, 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 a real good reason behind the Razer phone? Yes, there is a real good, it, it's supposed to deliver you an insane mobile gaming experience. And that's, and, and that's fine. It's intended to do that. That's what it's for. It's intended to do that. Um, but yeah, people are like, it doesn't have an all-screen display. Like, why would that matter for, for something that it is clearly the reason that it's there for, the reason that it's in existence, the reason why Razer bought Nextbit? It's for gaming. It's not for show and look. It's for gaming. Having an all-screen display doesn't mean that you're going to have the greatest experience. You may have an even worse experience than what you've had with the phone that you've previously owned before. So I, I then say the current state of mobile technology is about gimmicks. Gimmicks is one of the biggest the, the, the biggest portions of developing a phone. And I don't see it clearing up anytime soon because they, they're only going to do what the masses want. Or what the masses get into. Like they show you a gimmick, you bought into it, no disrespect there, but you bought into it and you base every other phone off of that as a standard. So now OEMs are all going to do the same thing. Well, let's focus more on gimmicks than we will on performance. And there they go. Off to the races. iPhone and their notch and 3D facial recognition, you know, Samsung and its infinity display and, you know, going on so forth and forward. And, what about like you know the diehard geeks and the diehard nerds that that want something that's gonna relatively always be smooth even through updates in in the generations at, you know going forward that we're, we're gonna luck out on it. Prime example: the Moto E4 and the E4 Plus. Really good budget phones. Really really good. Okay, really good. I love them. I love both of them, and I and I rarely I rarely own a Moto device, and I like those two phones. They're not, they're not set scheduled to even get Oreo. They're not going to get 8.0 or 8.1. They're not going to get it. The Moto G5 Plus will. The Moto G5 will. The Moto X4, you know, they will get Oreo. The Moto E4 is not listed to get Oreo. But, I mean, it, you know... To, to my argument on that, it's just like, they have other plans, they have other focuses, and those focuses, you know, to me, are just misplaced and misguided. 
you know, I, sure, I understand why every smartphone does not get updates. I totally get it. You know, the Moto E4 Plus just came out this year. Oreo was just unveiled this year. It's not scheduled to get it anytime this year or anytime next year. And that's where I'm like, okay, this is this is a phone you put out there that a lot of people are starting to dig. A lot of people are starting to buy it. Hell, um, some of my YouTube friends are the reasons why the Moto E4 for Verizon sold out in places like Walmart and Target. And it's not set to get Oreo. But it's just because... You know, they have other plans. They have other ideas of things that they got to do. And, um, you know, of course, like, you know, the Moto X4, which is the first uh, American Android One device. And also the first non-Nexus and non-Pixel device to be able to be used on Project Fi. So if you have Project Fi and you want something that's not a Nexus and something that's not the Pixel, but you want to try Project Fi, well, you got an option with the Moto X4. You know, I'm not saying that having gimmicks on your phone is a bad thing. I'm not saying that OEM shouldn't try to wow you with a little gimmicky thing to make you feel extra gooey inside when you buy a brand new smartphone from them. But I still believe that, you know, this, these software experiences can get better. There's no such thing as a perfect phone. There's no such thing as a perfect smartphone. There's no such thing as a perfect operating system. It can get better. The, the way I feel about it is, is that the moment an OEM or the moment that a tech company like Google or Apple, the moment they feel like that they have the perfect operating system and the perfect phone is the moment that they're dead. That's when the company goes down. That's when it goes to kaputs because if you stay in the mind focus of making something better, even if... People will say, oh yeah, I love iOS 11, you know, 1.1. I think it's, 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 it's the best and I think it's the most perfect operating system ever. If you rely on that and you stay on that, then you'll be stuck on that and then it will never get better. Same with Android. If everyone was like Android 8.0 Oreo is the best, is the most perfect mobile operating system, that's the death of Android that's where it's going to die, only because then we'll never see anything else beyond that to make the experience better. There has to be a balance. There has to be a balance between, um, you know, making the experience better and also providing you some wow factors to it. So that's all in a nutshell. Moving forward, I want to focus on a old project that never came to light. Other OEMs took this idea and took the ball and ran with it and ran 100,000 yards away and never looked back. And I'm talking about Motorola and I'm talking about LG and Essential and all these other ones, all these other OEMs. I'm talking about them. And, and the phone that I'm referring to is Project Aura, the phone we never got to really see. Unless you went to Google I.O. two years ago and you got to see the progress they made with Project Aura and you got to witness them demo the camera module being used. Now, if you don't know what Project Aura is, Project Aura was the foundation for modular phone technology. So you had a base phone, you have a bunch of modulars, and you could switch out to basically give your phone a different experience. How do I think they were going to do this? I honestly think there was going to be three different screen display bases well, allowing you the option to add what type of battery you wanted on it, what type of camera module you wanted on it, what type of processing chip you wanted on it, how much RAM you had on it. it everything was in modulars. They called it the Lego phone. Um, it just, you know, you had a phone on the back. It looked like a bunch of bricks that you were like building like a brick wall. Yeah, it wasn't the greatest and prettiest design, but the idea to allow you to upgrade your phone based on buying new modulars for your phone, that was one thing that I really looked forward to. I looked forward to it because I felt that that would have changed the way that 
you know, mobile technology is. Rather than always having to buy a new uh, smartphone pre-built together by, you know, um, the OEM uh, manufacturing company, you could just buy one base, one base of the phone, one, one, the, the, the spine, if you want to call it that, and build on top of it to build your skeleton structure of what smartphone you wanted to have. So maybe, you know, you're on a budget, so you bought the base of the phone. Say they charge you $120 for the base of the phone. Each modular costs you about anywhere between 15 to 50 bucks, depending on what you were getting. Um, so you started off with the basics. You got, a, you got a base of the phone, and then you got a, you know, um, a quad-core processing chip. You got one gigabyte of RAM. You got an eight megapixel rear camera. Um, the base of your phone already has you know, a modular section for the front facing, so you had like a two megapixel front facing camera. So you started off base price around there, right? Yeah, it sounds expensive because if you think about it, you're probably spending like about like $200 right then and there, okay? So who knows, maybe they would have to drop the price and make the base of the phone 50 bucks, make each modular anywhere between five and $50, depending on what you're getting. Who knows what they would have done, but just that, you get the idea of it. When you wanted to upgrade, if you wanted more RAM, you could have bought the modular that had the random access memory in it and upgraded that way. Take off the old one and put the new one on and now you just increase from one gig to three gigs or one gig to six gigs. You, you know, that that was the idea of Project Aura and it's so sad that it, it died. It died, but then on top of that, but we thought, okay, you know what, it died, but LG was going to bring us something and Motorola was going to bring us something. They, they kind of did it. I mean, if you look at LG, everyone makes fun of their modular technology because it was just, you know, where you would take off the bottom of the phone and just put on a different, uh, you know, bottom piece to it. One was a camera and, um, uh, you know, all, all kinds of other stuff. And um, it, it just, it gave you different options to use. And then Motorola did the same thing. You have um, your Moto mods. One is a JBL um, dual speakers. One is a projector. Um, one is, um, you know, for like extended battery. I mean, this is, it, it, it's modular in that you can put modules onto it, but it wasn't modular like how Project Aura's dream was. And I really wish that Project Aura could be resurrected. I really want to see what Project Aura would have done in the real world market to see where it would have gone. If it died after being out here for a year and no one felt the need to want to buy a product like that, then let the masses speak. But it just, it never launched beyond anything other than words, hopes, dreams, and the photograph that showed that the modular camera worked. That was it. They go any further than that. And so with that very reason, I'm like, Ugh. the possibilities of what could have been. So, the Razer phone being out there, and a lot of people just kind of curious about it. Um, is it one phone that I may try to grab? I'm not sure if I want to grab it. Um, reason being is just, you know, I just, I think it's cool. Uh, I think it's going to have a lot, of, it's going to give you a really good experience. It's just that I just, I don't know, maybe right now I just don't have the passion of wanting to grab one and review it. Uh, maybe it might change down the road. Maybe I might grab one, you know, a couple of months after. I don't, I don't know. I really don't know um, as far as, like, devices that I really want to review because I feel like that when I'm reviewing devices today, they're pretty much all just about the same, you know, with just different brand names and maybe a few things here and there that's different. But um, it's just, uh, it just feels repetitive and it's just like, eh, uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm getting burned out. Maybe we're getting burned out of opening up a box with the phone inside of it and getting all, you know, toasty warm and everything like that. I don't know. I rather much would just talk about, you know, what's happening in, in the world of technology, basically. Um, technology. And even then, you know, vaping is technology. You got to think about it. Way back in the day, if you wanted nicotine, you had some choices. You had to chew tobacco or you smoked a cigarette, cigar or whatever, or, or a cigarello. If it's like, a, like a, you know, if you don't know what a cigarello is, it's like a miniature... Um, cigar but not really so much per se a cigarette now you have electronic devices that vaporize these uh what they call e-juice it's just a form of oil and uh, you inhale you get your nicotine you exhale it's just like smoking a cigarette electronic electronics 
the technology used to build this because there is a chip inside to regulate these things so they don't explode on you. Um, so it is technology. And I think I am going to start talking about that uh, pretty soon. I'm gearing up for that. Um, so this week is going to be absolutely crazy because it's the holidays and it's going to be hard to be putting up videos and doing stuff like that. So um, I will try my best to do what I can with YouTube and whatnot. But uh, I'm also on Spreaker, so I do podcasts. I haven't done any last week. Um, I usually do my podcast on my lunch break at work, but I haven't done any last week only because last week's been very, very, very busy at work. And so the moment that I, I leave to go to lunch, I just want to relax and not do anything for that hour because I've been taking in, you know, some, some extra time and whatnot. Um, but anyhow, that's pretty much it. I would really would love to know what your guys' thoughts and opinions are. So if you guys want to share that, you guys can in the comment section of whichever social networking site you're viewing this from. Um, every Sunday at this time, I'll be doing live broadcasts here. So I'll try to. I'll try to. i got to stop saying that. I will try to do a live broadcast every Sunday at the same time. Um, if I don't, I will at least try to let you guys know that there's, that there's not going to be one. We're going to get in the groove of being consistent with this. Um, because I like this. Going live, I like this. Maybe next time I'll have more people join in. You know, I, I, this was just so out of out of random, so I'm, no one no one's really here to interact. Next time it'll be a little bit different. I'm going to try to get more people in here. I will interact with you guys in the comments. We'll go over some stuff. So, um, but yes, that is it for today. I need to take the rest of this day to enjoy, and you guys should too. And it's really cloudy outside, so um, yeah. So, oh, and I will start doing videos about certain tricks and things that I find that's beneficial for, for those who are type 2 diabetic. I'm going to try and get into that um, and explore that field and, and just kind of like let you guys know how that all works out. So, anyways, if you watched the replay, thanks for watching. I love you guys very much. And I'll talk with you on the next one. Bye.